maybe somebody who is uh, is David Rosenberg, who joins us, I believe, from from New York this morning. Uh, David, good morning to you. Oh, from Toronto. Morning. Uh, good to see you. It's always nice to have you and Rich together. Uh, old. It's a, little, it's a little reunion. Old pals. I, I, I wish I was with my two friends. Uh, I wish I was in New York right now so I could give them both a bear hug. <laughs> <laughs> and you mean that literally, I imagine. Um, uh, how are you feeling right now, uh, David, as we as we go crazy over Dow 10,000? Are you getting a, a big chuckle out of it? Is it doing anything uh, to alter your longstanding bearish stance? Well, you know, the uh, uh, this is the, uh, what, the 26th time that we've crossed over 10,000. So... Uh, my view is that we're still in this secular uh, bear market. We've obviously had a very significant cyclical bull market in that context. My big concern is that uh, the markets have gotten ahead of the economy. Uh, I'm not going to debate the economic outlook uh, with Rich or with Dennis. It's obviously improved from where it was in March. Uh, I don't really think it's improved to the tune of 60% increase in the equity market. I think right now when I back out the valuation, I get that the S&P 500 is pricing in $85 of operating earnings, which would be a double from where we are right now. And it usually takes four to five years to double corporate earnings off a recession low. So I just think the market's gotten ahead of itself. Uh, I'm not nearly as bearish as I was, uh, say, uh, you know, six or nine months ago, but the market has clearly overshot the fundamentals in my view. Where You say you're not as bearish. Can you talk to us about when or how you, you altered your view? Well, at the, ver at the lows, Rich, uh, back in March, uh, I basically turned agnostic. I was telling folks we were probably going to get down to a six handle on the S&P 500. We got down there, and uh, I basically turned agnostic. I was actually uh, hoping and praying that uh, we would actually get to an egregiously oversold low like we did in 1982 when we got a 6% a dividend yield, a, uh, a P.E. multiple of eight, and really get egregiously oversold so I could shed this perma bear status, go into Gluskin Chef and Associates in Toronto and become the Marlboro man and start to turn uh, bullish. And I never had the opportunity because by the time I joined Gluskin Chef, the market was already up, nine fi up to 950 from 666 at the low. So, uh, the, you know, when I take a look at the data and I take a look at what earnings are priced in, I think the market should be trading somewhere between 850 and 900. You know, with all deference, nine months ago, that would have been a, an outlandishly bullish view. Yeah. The bottom line is that no matter how better the fundamentals are, in quotes, the fundamentals, of course, most of this recovery is being premised on dramatic government incursion into the capital markets and of the economy. The bottom line is that the stock market, like other markets, have a tendency to overshoot and undershoot the fundamentals. I can understand the bullish case. Uh, my point is that... The prices have overshot the fundamentals, and I'd be looking for either the fundamentals to play catch up to the pricing or the pricing ultimately to play catch down to the fundamentals. Dave, uh, this time it is rich. And um, the, the question I have for you is, you know, your, your great call over the past couple of years was on the consumer sector. You saw things in the consumer sector that nobody else saw. If you were advising Washington, now you're a Canadian, so you're, you're completely objective on this, I'm sure, but if you were advising Washington about the consumer and the consumer sector, what would you tell them to do and what would you tell them to be looking at very carefully? Well, I, I'd be trying to uh, get them to think about uh, saving for their retirement. You know, consumer spending is 71% of GDP. And right now we're conflicted. We want the economy to revive, so we're doing cash for clunkers and home buyer subsidies, even though the home ownership rate is still above its long-run norm. And we're trying to encourage people to save for their retirement. At the same time, we're trying to get them to spend more money. So we're almost conflicted right now. My sense is that what we should be focusing on is skills, education, uh, productivity, uh, and capturing export share globally without necessarily just relying on a weaker U.S. dollar. I mean. Rich, we have a 25% youth unemployment rate in this country. Uh, we have a problem where the savings rate is still too low to finance uh, the, the future increases we're going to have in terms of health care and Social Security. We've we got bigger issues right now than trying to ensure that we're going to maintain uh, this cycle of overconsumption. You know, this was a 25-year credit cycle. It was a 25-year period of, uh, not 10-year, but 25-year period of living above our means. And now we're going to have to live below our means uh, and that means a rising savings rate. And I think the government should be promoting uh, more of a savings culture. And instead of promoting consumption, let's embark on policies that are going to foster capital spending and productivity. As a strategist who worked hand in hand with, mm -hmm. with David, how do you play off that? I mean, is, does not working at the same place allow you to disagree more than you did then? 
Well, I think we do. Well, we always disagreed or not agreed. It so happens that over the past several years we did agree. But probably right now is probably the time that Dave and I are most in disagreement in the time I've ever known Dave. I think I think I'm a little bit more on the bullish side than than Dave is because uh, I still agree with Dave completely on the secular problems. I think the United States and what he what Dave just outlined is absolutely correct. I think Washington is completely misaligning policy with what we really need for long term goals in the United States. But I think in the, in the short term here, and by that I mean the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, we can have a pretty good cyclical pop. Because of? But because we, we, of, we've had a cyclical pop already, though, right. Rich. Yep. I mean, right. I mean, if the, I mean no, normally the market, between the time the market bottoms and the recession ends, you're up 20%. Uh, we're up 60% right now. And usually in that, in that interval, uh, when, you're, when you're up 60%, uh, like, look where we were up 60% in the last cycle, Rich. We were already into the fall of 2005. Things were so hot that, uh, that the Fed was already halfway through its tightening cycle. So it's not a matter of being bullish on the economic outlook. The question is, what, what's embedded in, in equity valuation right now? And, and the two of us went through, and, and it's not as if we were overly bearish on the economic outlook back, say, four or five years ago. It was mm -hmm. the amount of speculation, Correct. and it, was, it came down to valuation. But you see, back then, you see, this is, this is what, uh, what I'm trying to get at, is that it, maybe you're right for the next 12 to 18 months. I'm not so sure about that because so much is priced in. But let's look at the fundamental outlook. Let's look at, at the trend line because how many 12 to 18-month rallies were there in the 1930s? or in Japan in the 1990s. Let's focus on the long-term trend line. And I have a tough time believing that you can destroy $14 trillion of net worth Absolutely. in the United States. That you can take out, like right now, bank lending is contracting at a 15% annual rate. And who's filling the void? The Fed, the FHA, Fannie, Freddie. This is not some, with all deference to what the stock market has done, the stock market was hitting highs no. in the fall of 2007 on the eve of the worst recession in the past 70 years. So irrespective of what the stock market may be telling us, the stock market doesn't always get it right. But it's hard to believe with the amount of wealth implosion that we've seen and the amount of private sector credit that's come out of the system that this is going to be a straight line up even for the next 12 or 18 yeah. months. He's always persuasive, isn't he? He is. And <laughs> he very rarely takes a breath. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna, we'll, we'll get Rich's uh, reaction to that in a little bit because we have to run, David. But it's really good seeing you. And we, hope, uh, we look forward to seeing you on set next time. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Uh, David Rosenberg, Gluskin Chef. Interrupt.